Yeah, awesome. Uh, hey guys, how you doing? I'm here with Kerwin Ray in uh, Gold Coast, Australia at the Freedom Team event. And I wanted to have a quick conversation with you around what you mentioned earlier about implementing Gary Vee's um, strategies that he taught and you being one of his top students. And he said that was super cool that you said that. Uh, what would you say that you did when you first learned about some of those strategies? And what, where did you start with implementing it? And then how have you turned it into your own brand? Yeah, like originally? I just... I'm, I'm, I'm like monkey see monkey do, you know, right. um, I'm not necessarily the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm the most consistent in mm -hmm. most cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm very disciplined and yeah, I just, he kicked my ass and uh, gave me some really solid feedback and then I just watched what he did and yeah, hired my first filmmaker um, and just started producing content. And originally it was like one video a week. Mm -hmm. I think for the first six months, Matty, it was like one video a week, maybe even nine months, we were producing one video a week. Mm -hmm. And that just started to take off and then it was two new videos a week and then it was three new videos. And even now we're only producing maybe, I don't know, well, maybe seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 videos a week of this new content, but we mm -hmm. have such a bank now that we can just republish on a regular basis. But the thing was just doing it. And I think mm. most people are, are frozen waiting for the plan when the plan is right in front of them, you know, yeah. and they look for reasons to not to do it when every reason to do it is right in front of them. So yeah, and I think that's really common. I've I've definitely fallen into that trap of it's not perfect, it's not good enough, and then yeah. right when you think you figured it out, you see somebody change the the whole game plan. Like even Gary, like right when you think you know how he does the progress bar, as an example, all of a sudden it's completely different. So yeah. it could feel like you're never able and to catch up. Well, it's not even about trying to catch up. Don't try and catch up. Just try and do something. You know? Yeah, I think that that's the problem. Is people are it's that whole perfection scenario. They're waiting to be completely perfect. At everything they're doing mm. until they start and it's not about being perfect like i said to that lady before she said what do i do i said throw spaghetti at the wall mm. just fucking start mm -hmm. you know just do something because that's where you're going to learn and it's not about being gary and it's not about being me and it's not about being like you know anyone else it's about how do you find what works for you mm -hmm. you know because you know what what's good content for one personality in one brand is not going to be good content for another personality in another brand mm -hmm. the framing the contrast you know the edit everything's unique you got to find what works for you so how did you originally identify what your audience wanted like how was that process for you because i'm in that similar situation yeah right now. like uh, what well, they really want I threw spaghetti at the wall mm. i just started publishing content and the first piece of content that we published was called the social experiment mm -hmm. which was um basically our transition from being you know you can see that on youtube or on facebook uh from being a traditional marketing business to being a social media marketing business and all the headaches you know all the turnover in team you know you know at one stage there we had like a 50 percent turnover over in team and that was almost on a monthly basis at some points wow. and so there's a lot of drama the internal team you're talking yeah. about yeah yeah wow because you know because for us we're such a cultural culturally centric business and as we grew our culture was such so unique it was like cinderella's shoe mm. you know and so many people would come in thinking that they wanted to be thinking that they were cinderella they put the shoe on them but they go oh the shoe's so pretty it really is uncomfortable but it would take them sometimes a few weeks before they realize or we realize that uh, it's not a, just mm. a right fit and I, you know we're kind of the organization where if it doesn't fit don't force it right you know let me set you free to find your, you know, what it is that you're here to do and, you know, relieve me of, of the requirement of having to service you in something that you don't enjoy because voids breed vacuums and I think sometimes we hold on for team to, for too long, we, we hold on to relationships in general for right. too long, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not until we release those relationships that we give that person the potential to find what they need mm -hmm. in whatever context but that void in itself produces a vacuum that will suck in what's required for mm -hmm. us to to evolve to that next, yeah, that next yeah, level. that's powerful. I, I had that similar thing happen with hiring an assistant. I just couldn't find the right fit because it was like, I wasn't sure. At first I blamed them, like, you guys suck at what you're doing. And then I realized actually it's me. Like I wasn't delegating properly or, or managing expectations. Yeah. So did you did you go through that? Do you have like a specific checklist or a process of like what you're looking for for look, a videographer? Yeah, or, look, or, we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty tight in our recruitment process, but we still don't get it right because our our culture is so unique, but we look at, you know, we look when whenever we're recruiting, we look for two things. We look for culture mm. and we look for performance. Because yeah, our team, you know, we're almost 50 now, and we're a high performing culture. Like, and I mean, every person in our company that lasts beyond their probationary period, they're a high performer, which means they produce at a level that very few people can. Mm -hmm. So for me, performance is one thing. So we have the performance metrics in place that are linked from the tasks that they do on a daily basis that link to the goals that they're trying to achieve on a weekly basis that link to the priorities that have strategic significance on a quarterly basis and an annual basis mm -hmm. that's linked to the mission which is what we're trying to complete on a 10 year basis so everything kind of comes back to the thing that they're doing on a daily basis and we measure that performance on the culture side you know we have a very clear set of values that are important to the organization that are literally painted on the wall and around the office and mm. that we review them on a, on a like on a, on a daily basis in our huddles every morning we review what our values are and everyone chooses a value they're going to live for the day you wow. know? and every month we have the Wowsers Award where people get nominated and acknowledged for the values that they live and we don't just say oh, I want to nominate this person for you know we are family so I 
want to know, you know, Matthias, where we are family, because the other day I was having a tough day and he came in and he's like, he sat down for half an hour and he just asked, how are you doing? And he listened and wow. that to me was really important. So the way that we reward our team, you know, we don't necessarily reward, look at rewarding people just on a financial basis. We're trying to reward them on a social basis. We're social creatures mm. and significance to human beings is actually important, but not in the context that most people think. Significance to most people is really important from the context of feeling important. Mm -hmm. And if you can demonstrate to people how important they are by pointing to behaviors that they demonstrate, they start to see that connection and they start to build worth. Mm -hmm. And when someone has self-worth, they believe more in themselves and you get much more level, greater levels of performance out of them. So do you ask people what they want to be rewarded on the social side? Is it like No, you don't like have they, to ask. You, you, you watch. You watch. You, you ask questions. You know, I, I never sit down and say, so tell me what your values are. It's always questions like, so, so what did you do on the weekend? Mm. You know, what do you do for a hobby? Like, what lights you up? What mm -hmm. juices you up? What is it when you're doing it that you lose time and space? Like, what teams do you follow? Like, what are the things that you really enjoy to do? Because mm -hmm. if, if you ask questions and you just listen, you'll find out what's important to people. If you just watch the way people behave, you'll find out what's important to them. And then you just, you know, you, you serve those values. But that's where the alignment is so important. Mm. So when we recruit, we're looking for, I don't want to convert people to my 13 values. Mm. I want to hire people who are already aligned with my 13 it's values. It's perfect fit, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, because to me, it's like, I'm, I'm looking for someone who's had, already had a level of programming already done. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking to, you know, rewrite someone. And, and I don't mean that in a discriminatory way. I just mean that in, you know, I'm looking, I'm a business, right? And I'm looking for a level of performance and a level of return on my investment. And I'm not a charity. And my business is about helping people. And the more people I have that are aligned with what it is I do, the more people I can help. Mm -hmm. And obviously the more commercial that becomes at the same time. And so for me, you know, like we, we have this saying that no one man is more important than the mission. No one man is more important than the team. And if there's one person that's compromising the team or there's one person that's compromising the mission, I don't care if they're the most valuable player on the team. Mm -hmm. If they fucking are toxic to the environment or if they act entitled in ways that, you know, cause disruption, then, you know, they're on, they're on, a, they're on, a, they're on a short fuse. They have to go, yeah. Well, it's not that they don't have to, they have to go. It's like, mm. to me, I'm, I would much prefer to, to re rehabilitate before I to exit people. And when, you know, when you remove someone from your organization, it's very traumatic to fire someone. Mm. And so my, my goal is to never fire someone. It's always to ask them the questions to help them recognize that they either belong or they don't. Mm. And again, not in a discriminatory way, just to help them realize, well, fuck yeah, I don't really enjoy being here. And so that's then it's a lot easier for them to go, well, you know what, I now thank you for asking me that question. I now recognize I don't really belong here in, based on what's important to me. I, I think I'm gonna hand in my resignation. And I would fucking, I'd take that any day of the week over saying you're fucking fired because you're not aligned with our culture or mm. performance. Because that can be, that can, even for some people, depending on their own psychological makeup, that can create low levels of trauma. Yeah. You know, I'm not that into cre sense. creating trauma for someone. I don't wanna fucking make someone's life any hard. Life's hard enough as it is. Mm. You know, you wanna give people the tools that make life easier. And, and if someone leaves my environment empowered, because like, well, I told Kerwin and I fucking resigned. Great, mm -hmm. use that, become empowered. Go out there and conquer the world and do your thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need my approval. Mm -hmm. That's super powerful. Um, thanks for your time. I, I just want to leave with one more question and that is based on your experience, you've been building this now for a few years, you said, right? 20, almost 20 years. Not, not the social, oh, social media, experiment. Yeah, the social media yeah, yeah. Experiment, yeah. Uh, it'll be three years, March 31st. Three years, March 31st. So during that three year journey, you said there's three years left um, in your talk earlier about personality brands really becoming solid in the marketplace. Yeah. And so for somebody who's starting pretty fresh now, uh, besides the stuff because you guys weren't there, but uh, what would you be, say the one lesson is that you've learned in terms of um, the first 90 days or like where to focus your time? And like It's not even 90 days. It's like looking at this as a three year project and realizing if, if you don't get in now, if you don't solidify your space in the lineup, of personalities, because you know, as we discussed, you've got the internet, mm -hmm. okay, you've got the dark web, you've got the deep web, you've got the internet, you've got platforms, yes. and then you've got personalities. Mm -hmm. And you know, every aspect, let's forget the everything below the line, when you've got the internet and you've got the platforms, most platforms are, are quite established right now. Mm -hmm. You know, They're established in terms of, you've got the Amazons, you've got the Googles, you've got the Facebooks, you've got the Instagram, and to penetrate into those markets, it's almost impossible mm -hmm. because there's the level of domination there, and the money, you know, they've got the money to come in and buy you up, or buy you out, or take you out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you start to look at it from the personality and the branding perspective, there's still a level of fluidity. It's not completely set yet, mm -hmm. but in the next three years, it will be almost as set as what the, where it is at the platform level, mm -hmm. you know, at the, brand, at, at, at the business level. And so right now, it's about getting in while you can and getting your piece of market share. Because three years from now, when the corporates start rolling in the big dollars, it's going to be so, no it's already noisy. It's just going to be a lot fucking noisier. So how are you going to, if you're a personality brand, what is it in your criteria to become one of those dominant brands? Like, what do you think it takes you've got to, to get a, You've got to be informative, entertaining, humorous, you know, inspiring inspiring, aspiring, you've got, to, you've got to be able to break through and communicate in a way that's relative and relevant to the values of the market that you're trying to communicate to. You know, you know, what I talk about in business that the two most important things are relationship and values and those two things are symbiotic. 
because in order to build a relationship, like what determines a level of attraction on any level, whether it be intimate or just on a social level, is a level of commonality. Mm -hmm. And those are shared values, things that are of shared importance. And values breed value. Mm -hmm. And we get value from a relationship when we have our values that are met. Mm -hmm. And when our values are met at a high level, consistently a relationship is formed. And the level of depth of that relationship depends on how deep those values go that are shared. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can share values with the marketplace, the more we can understand what the values are. And that would be the step one. Step one, understand the values of your marketplace. What's important to my market? Mm. And then if those are things that are important to you, then start sharing those things in a constructive and practical mm. way. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. That you was valuable. Thank you. Awesome, man.